Thomas, hello, welcome, sir. How are you doing? I'm good. I started to salute there, but my mic is all up in in the way. So, right. The, as far as I'm concerned, the only people you need to salute are your superiors <laughs> and uh, Kate Mulligan. So, uh, and and don't forget Colonel Carrots. He gets a salute. Yes. Yes. <laughs> uh, thank you very much for joining us here. Um, the name of the show is From Birth to Schmodown. So, Thomas Harper, where were you born? I'm originally from Greensboro, North Carolina, so the heart of ACC country, if you're a college basketball fan. Uh, what other big sports are from around there? If you're a fan of NASCAR, there's no track in Greensboro, but um, growing up, you have Charlotte Motor Speedway is the big one down the road. That's about, if you're unfamiliar with North Carolina geography, it's about an hour and a half-ish from almost directly south from Greensboro. So, but college basketball was was the big one. Um, I grew up at a weird time. I'm a 90s kid, but uh, there was no, in terms of pro sports in North Carolina, there was none. There was no Carolina Panthers until I was in elementary school. I, th I think they, they expanded in 95. Um, no pro baseball team still to this day. And, and so you had this weird, and there's no pro hockey team either, uh, unlike now. And so you had this weird, like, geographical, like, split between fans. So I grew up, like, uh, the Atlanta Braves were huge, but I didn't really, I grew up a Red Sox fan because of my grandfather. I grew up a Redskins fan, or now the, a football team fan, because uh, of my, grand, uh, uh, my grandfather as well. And uh, hockey, I didn't understand what it was until the Mighty Ducks came out. <laughs> <laughs> so. oh, man. Um, I, I, I'm right there with you on the might on the mighty ducks thing. I still don't understand hockey, uh, <laughs> but I, I do. Uh, I do think the Chicago Black Hawks Blackhawks have a really cool logo. That's uh, true. So a dumb, stupid team, but <laughs> yeah. Uh, did you play any sports growing up? Uh, uh, was that was that one of the things you were interested in? Or yeah, I played baseball growing up, not with any like high level of skill or anything like that. And then I had an uncle that taught me golf, and so uh, my best friend that lived across the street from me, we didn't have the money to go play at courses. You know, but I don't come from a whole lot, uh, but we uh, we kind of hashed out a course in his backyard using wiffle ball golf balls, like the practice golf balls. So we like on Thursday, we just like start a tournament, like a four day tournament and we'd play. And, um, you know, that just stayed, stayed kind of a hobby, but baseball was the thing. I was within a, a bike ride of, uh, the ballpark where we played. So that was, that was an everyday thing. We'd get together sort of like the sandlot, get together a group. And until we lost all our, uh, we played with tennis balls because, uh, we knocked one too many windows out with baseballs, but so we lost all our tennis balls over the over the fence, and nobody was willing to go jump it and go run and get them. That we we just played till it was dark like that. So okay, well, well, if, okay. Now in Sandlot, there was valid reason not to go over the fence and get them. What was your what was the reason in this case? Laziness. <laughs> it was, and usually, so there was a pecking order, right? I my best friend was uh, was one of seven kids, so they formed like the core of our teams, but all the other brothers were younger. So there's a natural sort of chain of command there. And the youngest would always get pegged to go get the balls. Like you got to go hop the fence and collect everything. Well, he'd quit and cry. And then, you know, we'd be down a player. So we'd switch, you'd have one person all time pitcher and everybody would fight over that. And the whole thing would just like fall apart completely all because nobody wanted to jump the fence and <laughs> get a damn ball. <laughs> Well, no big dogs, no beasts. Yeah, yeah. Um, what was your favorite position to play? So I grew up playing outfield, but just like messing around, pitching was always fun. Just because you could, you know, we like we grew up at a time where you had like Glavin, Smoltz, uh, Maddox on the mound for the the Braves. That was like the the big big thing. Um, Clemens was still pitching for the Red Sox, and and. Uh, so everybody wanted to be that ace on the mound, and uh, we always we always joke with that. And then uh, when McGuire had, I'm trying to think the summer was it 97 or 98? He had the he broke the home run record. 
we bought, we pooled our money and bought like a cool poster that had the entire Cardinals schedule and we would mark the number of home runs he had in every single game, the entire season, just ticking toward the record. Uh, and, and so that was, that was a lot of fun. So we'd argue over who got to be McGuire. Although in hindsight, that's like, it's like a little asterisk by that summer, I guess. Ah, uh, that's all right. Dude, in the moment, you don't know, you, you know. It, it's <laughs> I was okay. 12. I didn't, I didn't care. Yeah. <laughs> Who was your favorite team? NBA, I, uh, I grew up a Red Sox fan, so my grandfather. Oh, you're right. I apologize. Yeah, my grandfather, for whatever reason, he's not from New York. He's from a, a small town in North Carolina called Tarboro, which is down east in the state. Uh, very poor uh, little town to this day, but um i don't know how quite frankly i don't know how he ever got connected in with uh with the red sox but i know that as part of their uh my grandmother was from new york city for their honeymoon they went to a Sox yankee uh Sox yankee series uh in new york they went to a couple games um right after they got married so that was kind of cool but yeah he was just i like all my memories are of him with a, a Sox game on on tv uh, he'd have like his AM radio up on his shoulder, like listening to the game if if he could pick up a, a game call, and yeah, so fond memories there. Do you know was he a Sox fan before they went to that series? I'm thinking maybe maybe that would give us a clue as to who won the series. Perhaps he could have been a Yankees fan if the Yankees won. <laughs> no, out. no, my girl, his I don't know when it started, but his his loyalties ran deep, and it could have been while he was in the army. He was in the army for a little bit in world war two. So, um, yeah, that's, I, I wish he was still around so I could ask him that. And I don't know why it, it never occurred to me. It just, it's like one of those things. It just is what it is when you're a kid. Like certain things are just like this household roots for this team. We were always a Red Sox family. So I didn't question it. Uh, what was the first thing you remember wanting to be when you grew up? <laughs> I I watched Top Gun as a kid, and I wanted to be the jet. I didn't want to – like, the pilot was sort of irrelevant. I wanted to be, like, a fighter jet when I was a little kid, just, like, jump off the, the deck and or whatever. Um, like, I, and then I think I evolved and realized that that was ridiculous and stupid, but you could be the pilot. And so I remember, like, really, really wanting to be a, a fighter pilot when I was a kid. Um, and then – just genetics got the better of me, and I'm just way too tall. To, to, I would fit in no cockpit. <laughs> uh, if you could give yourself a uh, a call sign, isn't that what it is? Like Maverick Goose, is, isn't it called a call sign? Mm -hmm. If you could give yourself one, what would it be? Back, like if I pull myself, if I set my Star Wars fandom aside and, and refuse to, to make it a Star Wars nickname, it'd probably be like, Wolfpack or something, just because that's that's my alma mater's uh, the NC State Wolfpack. But um, I like uh, I have to go with Dutch, the the gold leader. If I'm going with a Star Wars name, I'm, if if you're watching this and you don't know anything about me, you probably know that I'm a Y Wing fan. So yeah, I'd pick that one. Have the little uh, stylized helmet. Get somebody to put the graphics on there to mirror his helmet from the movie from A New Hope. That's great. Um... Obviously, you're a big Star Wars fan. Uh, it, folks who don't Hello. know who you are, you can tell by looking uh, looking behind you. It's uh, all virtual. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not. You're a super fan. Um, what was the first movie that you saw in the theater? I th My earliest movie, I don't know if this is the first one that I saw, but my earliest memories are of Jurassic Park and The Lion King. Which I don't know. I, if I was in singles, I'd be horrendous at movie release dates. So those I think came out around the same time. But yeah, Jurassic Park. I remember being scared shitless of the the raptors. The T Rex was just sort of like a force, right? You, right. You, it's almost like too big. You don't even know how to process uh, a creature like that. But the raptors were like scary bastards when you're seven, eight years old. <laughs> And, and the, you know, I just distinctly remember being in the theater and there's that scene where Lex and, and her brother are hiding in the kitchen and the raptors figure out how to open the door. And you're like, oh, shit. And that, that scared the piss out of me as a kid. But, yeah, I always have fond memories of JP. <laughs> yeah, that, that is a great movie. Um, 
Uh, now, as you're a teenager, like you're in your high school years, mm -hmm. or maybe junior high uh, into high school, what was uh, what were a couple of uh, coming of age movies? I guess that you really enjoyed. Um, for me, example, uh, Breakfast Club was one uh, was one for mm -hmm. me. I so I was really into uh, like action and comedy. So the two probably movies that I watched the most with my friends and we just like acted out and stuff had to be Happy Gilmore and The Rock with Sean Connery. Those two, I just remember we like as as kids, you know, a lot of kids or boys at least, I don't know, play war and stuff. We would play The Rock. So we'd sit there and like reenact the, the shower room scene where the seals are trapped on the bottom and Michael Bean's sitting there yelling like, I cannot give that order. And Ed Harris is up top with all his uh, traitorous Marines. And uh, yeah, we just, that we just endlessly quoted that movie. Uh, and, and we'd like, you know, we had Nerf guns in these, um, they, they're still around airsoft guns that fire plastic BBs. Uh, we had those and we just like play the rock out. We'd have scenarios like, you know, there's a, my friend's little brother would be like the the prisoner and we'd have to go like rescue him and stuff like that. So that movie was really central. And then Happy Gilmore was just like, like, hey, it's the funniest movie that Adam Sandler has ever made, in my opinion. But it hit at the perfect time. And it was like the perfect mix of humor that I got as a kid that just like seemed accessible to me. And I was just getting into and learning golf at the time. So like, I just remember going out to the driving range. We buy a bucket of balls and try to do the happy Gilmore swing. And I was like convinced somewhere in the back of my mind that I was going to drive it like 400, 500 yards and just knock it into the back net. <laughs> <laughs> but we were talking about that. I was talking about that with that movie with Evan the other day, just like gold leader, like how insanely quotable that movie is. Um, so yeah, that that'll forever be my favorite sandler movie but that that had a seminal place in my life as a kid um now what high school did you go to what was the name of it and what was the mascot so i went to a school called grimsley g-r-i-m-s-l-e-y which is a weird name in in central greensboro and we were the the whirlies which sounds just ridiculous it's a tornado we were just a tornado <laughs> and uh yeah, a big school, but I went there. I was out of town, so I was out of district. Uh, my parents were public school teachers, and so my mom wanted me at that school because she knew some of the teachers. They had a couple like academic programs that she wanted me involved with. Um, you know, worked a way for me to be able to go, and they wouldn't even send a bus out to my house. Like I lived twenty five minutes from where the school was, so my mom had to cart me in every day, and. It was a big high school. I came from like kind of a small like suburban town, and uh, this school was like like a thousand, twelve hundred kids. Which now, like nowadays, that's on the smaller end, like here in Pennsylvania where I live. But at the time, it was it felt like metropolis, and and so it was kind of like difficult at first to to find my footing. I was like I don't know how other other states are, but at least where I'm from, you went to school with the same group of kids. You went elementary school and and maybe some of those kids had known each other since pre-k or preschool and then you go to the same middle school together and you feed into the same high school i got pulled out i had gone to a different elementary school so i'd made new friends in middle school and then got ripped out of that and taken to a new high school so the you know really up until my junior year high school kind of stunk but it was a good school i no complaints other than the mascot name <laughs> were you the mischievous type or uh did you pretty much uh, follow the rules i like i really it, i had a tough time my freshman and sophomore year finding like who i was i was a massive star wars fan but got bullied really really badly in in middle school i went to like i went to like a um i'm trying to think of the right word for the elementary school that i went to it was like a, a really diverse uh elementary school and and like lots of different people and backgrounds and like uh, you know, not everybody was rich and stuff and it was just a good mix and, and people just sort of accepted. So like when I brought my Star Wars figures in into like fifth grade, like nobody really cared. That changed in middle school. I went to like a, just a middle school where the, the folks that were there, the kids that were there were predominantly from wealthier families and, and we just weren't. Like 
my parents were teachers. We weren't like poor, but uh, we didn't have a lot. And so I wasn't the kid with the nice clothes. And, and it was easy for like the cliques of kids to look at the kid wearing a Star Wars shirt and bringing, you know, bringing Star Wars figures in or whatever, talking about Star Wars to like put a big target on me. And so in middle school, I came in like really, or excuse me, high school, I came in like really guarded. And I was like, I don't know where I fit in. Still a diverse high school or whatever, but uh, you know, I don't want to walk myself into the same situation because it just, it just really sucked. Like middle school was horrendous for me. And so I, you know, freshman and sophomore year was like kind of a lonely, lonely experience. And I finally found my footing um, late in my sophomore year, I got involved in speech and debate, like a, a club. And I met the guy that would eventually be, he's my best friend now, but, but, um, he was best man at my wedding. Uh, we met each other in, in that speech and debate club. And that's where I sort of broke in and found my core, what would become my core group of friends. So to get back to your, your original question, I became sort of the, like part of a crew that would sort of push the boundaries where we could, um, starting in my junior year but it was like i didn't get into trouble it was it was just like stuff like like being ridiculous like i remember in in junior year in ap english we had this like very serious project revolving around like picking a poem and presenting like a very serious presentation about this poem and like breaking it down and i had picked a poem about abraham lincoln's assassination and then i just made a movie with all my star wars figures as like Abraham Lincoln and stuff. And he gets killed by like the rancor in it. Just ridiculous. I shot it on straight to VHS tape. And I just remember playing it. And I was like, this is awesome. And my teacher's like, I really don't like you. <laughs> and I don't want you in my class. So stuff like that. We would cut school and go play paintball. It, like nothing, just harmless stuff. Uh, do you still have that uh, video that you shot? God, I wish. Oh, somewhere somewhere at my parents house uh this is all like pre-digital so we had this like one of those massive camcorders that oh, you yeah. just put the vhs tape right in and it records straight to it so we're talking about like shootings like you want to shoot stuff i had no way to edit anything so you had to shoot your movie in sequence there was no editing <laughs> if you if you needed to redo a scene you had to rewind and record over what you had just yeah. done so yeah, somewhere maybe that's it's sitting around in a box. But we did that. That that's what me and my friends do. We did back then. We like played war games and went around and made movies. No. Yeah. Um. Now your junior year. Uh, I'm not sure exactly how to put this. Uh, you you would uh you got involved with the military. Uh, mm -hmm. we spoke a little bit about it before. Your your parents had to co-sign for you as you were you were a minor. Uh, what exactly happened there? Like, what made you decide that? Uh, had it been something you thought about up to then? And then what was that process like for you at that age? So I, I enlisted in my junior year of high school. I, obviously, I didn't ship off because you have to finish and get your, your uh, diploma and whatnot. But toward actually in the middle of my junior year is when I, uh, when I enlisted it, like shortly after I turned 17, which was the um, that was the minimum or the, the lowest age you could do, but you can't enter a, a legal contract if you're not 18. So if you look, I still have my enlistment contract to this day. You can see both my parents' signatures on it. Before that, I had no intention, no plan on ever joining the military. I, I don't come from a military family. I've got uh, my, my grandfathers were both in the army, but it just, it, it had never occurred to me. And it wasn't something even even like despite loving movies like Black Hawk Down and and Saving Private Ryan and uh, The Rock, it just it wasn't my thing. I I had no real interest in it. But coming into high school, I needed to fill out my schedule. There was a, a gap that I needed to fill with a class, and I picked up Army Junior ROTC. And just I no thought to it. Just hey, this class sounds interesting. Also, probably easy, uh, and let me take it. And I just, by the end of that year, by the end of my freshman year, I had fallen in love with it. At the time I came into that high school, I said, I said before that I didn't really have a place. Like that's the first place where I really found my footing. Um, Cause it was a, s a small class. We had maybe, I don't know, between all four grade levels, a hundred people in the entire battalion, which is pretty small. 
And it was just this close knit community. We did like the only extracurriculars I did that, that year were JROTC stuff like air rifle team and the color guard. We march out at basketball games with the flags and stuff. But I felt like I was part of something for the first time. I felt like there was discipline and structure, which is something I lacked uh, elsewhere in life. And I had two really good mentors because both of the instructors in the class were retired military. One was a, a retired lieutenant colonel and the other was a retired sergeant major, both from the army. And it's not a recruitment program. So like the, that whole class is just built to kind of teach basic, it's, it's like a civics light class if, um, where you also wear the uniform once a month. But I fell in love with it. And so I, I started to think about and, and explore pathways and knew that I would probably want to be a JAG officer down the line eventually, like way, way down the line. But I wanted to start out at the bottom and get the experience of what it was like to be given all the orders, to be on the bottom of the bottom of the totem pole, sort of where all the shit rolls down and, and ends up. And, and hopefully that would give me some perspective if I ever uh, you know, made it to being an officer one day. So I enlisted, I, to this day, I remember going down to, they call it MEPS, the Military Entrance Processing Center. They have them all over the place in the country, but this one was in Charlotte. And I sat down with the career counselor and she was like, what do you want to be? Like, you know, you got your, we got your test results, we got your grades. Um, and, and I was enlisted in the reserves at this point. And, and I was like, infantry. She was like, the reserves doesn't have int- infantry. The guard has infantry, but you're not doing the guard. And I was like, okay, tanks. And she was like, that's not a, that's not a thing. Tanks, like that's not a job. And I was like, well, what are my options? And she's like, uh, nutrition counselor. And I was like, the fuck? <laughs> like, <laughs> I was like, what, what are you talking about? Or like cook. And I was like, no, 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 none of those things. And then she was like, unit armor. I was like, well, what does the unit armor do? She was like, you run the, the unit arms room where all the, the big safe where all the, the guns are kept. I was like, that sounds cool. Like, give me that. I also had to worry about the length that training would be because I was delaying starting college so that I could do uh, do my training for the military. And that the more complex the job, the longer the training is. So like somebody like a, a military linguist, that's like a year long, a year's worth of training after you get done with basic training. And I couldn't do anything like that, at least not in my mind. I wasn't willing to delay college that long. Um, my job was eight weeks of, of training after basic training. So basically, I could fit everything that I needed within a single semester and then come back and not be too far behind. So signed up for that. Sight unseen. I had no clue beyond her description <laughs> what I was getting myself into. And then I shipped off to basic. Uh, the summer right after I graduated. So all my friends were getting ready to, to move to college and I was packing a duffel bag. And and what year is this that we're in now? Oh, three. Oh, three. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, and where did you have basic at? Down in Fort Jackson, South Carolina. And we had also, if, if you know, folks roll back their brains to, in history, we had just invaded Iraq four months prior. So you can imagine how excited my mom was for me to ship off to basic training and join the army at that point. <laughs> yeah. Oh man. Um, now at that point in time, you're in basic training. Okay. And you're in charge of the armory. Uh, now th- not in basic training. I went in charge of shit in basic training. Well, no, I mean, you go into basic. Training. <laughs> right. Probably, right. You go to your training for the armory. Uh, correct. Now, where is that located at? Is that still there on the same base or is, did you get relocated again? Yeah, you move. So v- there are a few jobs in the Army where you're going to do your basic training and your, they call it advanced individual training, AIT, um, just your job training. Mine required me to go to Fort Lee, Virginia, which is in Petersburg, just south of Richmond. So I had to get on a bus and get bust from, I didn't even get to like, I saw my parents on graduation day and then they're like, you know, go right back to your, uh, the, the open bay barracks. And the next morning I hopped on a bus and rode a, like an unair conditioned bus <laughs> up to Petersburg, Virginia. Um, now, now you get to your new location, uh, and what are your first impressions? You, you've, you've exited basic, uh, you're now starting this training and mm-hmm. you're like, okay, I get to, I get to be around a bunch of firearms and stuff. Um, was that the case and how, what was that like? Uh, 
Hell like, no. <laughs> was your Hell no <laughs> uh, no it was a lot of classroom work i mean the 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 core of the job is the logistics job so it's right. not just like this is why i joke about like my only concept of the job was what the career counselor told me and that wasn't very much it was like i enlisted at the end of the day she's trying to get out of there probably back to her house with her kids and stuff uh like tired of dealing with 18 17 year olds all damn day and i just wanted to get out of there so i could go back home and not because if you if you don't finish and and literally enlist, like my goal that day was to raise my right hand so I didn't have to come back down. And it's, I look back on it, it's like such a significant moment in my life because you're literally, you swear the oath, like you, they shuffle you into, your, into a room, your contract is signed, the flag is right there and it's raise your right hand and you're, you're swearing to, to support and defend the constitution. Like the literal oath where you're saying like, yeah, I'll give up my life in defense of the country. All I could think about was like, hell yeah now i don't have to come back down here i've i've checked this box <laughs> it's like you know the most short-sighted thing but uh, you know that's like being 18 i guess and so um training i had no concept what it would be but it was a lot of like my stuff was quite a bit of classroom work at the start of it and learning like the army logistics system and how uh, you know, cause it's not just about being around the weapons. It's about keeping accountability and all these things. And so I was like, Oh shit. Like, you know, what did I sign up for? But I grew to like it. Cause the, the thing that, that kept getting hammered home to us was like, nothing gets done without y'all. Like the whole unit would grind to a halt. If this stuff is, is not handled properly. If, uh, you know, if all these things. So, um, you know, I came around to it, but it wasn't like, you know, parachuting out of planes or anything like that. But um, I, I got like a really cocky mentality because at the by the end of basic training, I could run fast, like I could do a bunch of push-ups uh, very quickly. So I was like one of the better folks, like physically. And so they they naturally like you naturally rise to the top of the heap if if you can do those things. People, you know, you can run fast in the army. People just automatically assume that you're smart and you can do other things well. Like, wow, shit, man, he must have a big brain if he can run a six minute mile. And uh, and so I was like, I had that sort of mentality, and then had to like readjust because you know I'm coming into this world where they don't give a shit <laughs> about much of that. They want their their goal there. The drill sergeants there are there to get you ready to not jack stuff up at the unit. They, they need you ready to do that job as soon as you get where you're going. So it's just a different mentality. Whereas basic training is trying to break you as a civilian, break you down to nothing, and then build you just into a soldier um, yeah. and, and teach you those basic core skills. So very different environment, but yeah. Um, now at this point in time, you, you, you were aware, correct, that you wanted to be uh, an attorney in the military yeah and so uh does the military know this i'm curious like is this something where you're working with them and you're like i want to be a lawyer and a lawyer for you or is it where you're on your own time you're like i want to be a lawyer and then i tell them hey i want to be a lawyer can i be a lawyer for yeah you know how does all that work yeah no they they didn't know and if they did they wouldn't have cared because my contract was for me to serve as in a specific capacity and that was unit armor and that's what like if i went to my drill sergeant and was like i want to be an officer and i want to be a jag officer they'd be like "Fuck off like go back and do your work and um so i i also apologize for being foul mouthed but like this is <laughs> you're just being real but uh that like that's that's the reaction i would have gotten and and so really like you're you're sort of the master of your own career like you've got to make those decisions and to a certain extent figure out how to make those a reality because like somebody like a an army drill sergeant is on a particular career path they might be an an infantryman that's filling a job at that particular point in their career and they're on a like on an arc they might have absolutely and, and in most cases they have absolutely no clue about anything along the pathway that you're thinking about now it's very different if you're interested in something like if i went to them and said hey drill sergeant i would like to be a drill sergeant like what are the things that i need to do to to line myself up for that opportunity totally different story in that case but an enlisted soldier and if you're unfamiliar with the the way the military just is structured you've got enlisted soldiers which are your privates your sergeants yeah all the way up to sergeant major uh, 
And then you've got officers, lieutenants, captains, majors, colonels, generals. And they're almost like two different worlds in a way because they, you know, they fill very different roles in the military, even though they work uh, in a tightly knit fashion, no matter what job you're talking about. So, and, and as an enlisted soldier, especially in training, I had like zero access to any officers. I mean, they, we had our commander, but like the only time you saw him was if you like really jacked something up and you were in trouble. Uh, other than that, he was off handling, you know, captain stuff. So I knew that I was going to come back home, be in college, immediately start college. And I knew that I was going to enroll in the ROTC program at NC State. And that was my pathway. Beyond that, I hadn't really figured out the mechanics of it. I just knew ROTC, four years of that is how I become an officer. Let's let's knock that box out next. All right. And, and so you're doing that at the same time as you're getting your law degree, I assume. No, that that came next. It was like a <laughs> okay. a multi stage process. So I like I come back home and go to college. You have to get commissioned as an officer first, and then the next step was knocking out law school. Okay, okay. So once you've become an officer, then you can kind of say, "I would like to do this," and then yeah, yeah. And the way it works is when you get at least an ROTC because there there are different ways that you you can go to West Point and become an officer that way you can uh, go to something called officer candidate school which is like a, a compacted uh, course where you know you you on the back end of it if if you graduate because it's very tough then you become an officer but in all of those cases you give your preferences uh, for what you want to do and they the, the army for officers has branches so something like you could be an infantry officer that's a branch jag is a branch armor like tanks and uh you know other other vehicles like that that's a branch artillery is a branch think of them like general job fields okay you submit your preferences like hey i my first choice is jag my second choice is armor and my third choice is military intelligence but at the end of the day they put you on an order of merit list or so rank ordered list that you never see and they select where you're, what you're going to do. They, I mean, based on what the army needs at the time, how good you are in, in a variety of fields and then you get it. And what you get is what you get. So if they tell you, if you want to be a JAG officer and you say, Hey, I give me three years to, to go do law school and let me be a JAG officer. They could say, thanks for that. We appreciate that, but we're really going to need you as an artillery officer. And you know, at that point you're contracted, so you got to do what you got to do. You, you know, learn yeah. artillery at that point. <laughs> <laughs> it's a weird world because, like, on the civilian side, you get to choose what you want to do. If you don't want to do the thing that you're doing, quit. And if you want to do something in a completely different career field, go get trained up for that. Go learn or go find a job that's going to train you up for it and do that. It's not that way in the military. You get a choice in a sense, and, and sometimes you get to, to put a preference in, but especially as an officer, the army's gonna tell you what they need you and what want you to do, and that's it. And that's just a weird thing for a lot of people to think about. Yeah. Now, when you're going through your schooling uh, in your uh, to become a lawyer, um, is it are you learning civilian law as well as military law, or is it just mainly focused on military? So law school is all just normal civilian. I went to a, a, the, the army doesn't have a law school. So they, they rely on you to, to do your own thing. Uh, the army gave me the time. So they gave me, they said for three years, we'll delay your active duty service while you go do your law school thing. And on the back end, you come back to us. The catch is they'll give you the time, but they don't guarantee you a spot as a JAG officer. You still have to compete for those because at the time they were, it was like a 7% acceptance rate for JAG officers. Um, and so I went to law school. I, I didn't take a single class on military law, nothing, nothing like that. So normal law school curriculum. And then you come out, you, you take the bar exam, which you have to pass. And uh, during my third year, I had to apply just like anybody else to be a JAG officer. And I actually didn't, I didn't get picked up. I got, um, I got waitlisted. And I got put on a, uh, a standby list, an alternate list, and my heart dropped because I had to serve no matter what. If they didn't uh, let me in the JAG Corps, uh, was I, set to be? I was set to be an armor officer, I think. 
And so I was like, oh shit, my career might just take a severe left turn here. And fortunately somebody declined and I got up off the wait list. But um, yeah, and so once you're in the JAG Corps uh, as, a, as a lieutenant, then they send you to training, sort of a crash course for uh, three to four months where that's where you really get your first taste of military law. Okay. And, and I was just about to ask how the rankings work as far as like lieutenant and, and mm -hmm. all that stuff. Um, at the time that you're going through law school, uh, before you're officially a JAG officer, what is your rank at that point in time? So I, I was a second lieutenant coming out of law, or excuse me, coming out of undergrad. When I finished up ROTC, I commissioned, had a big, nice little ceremony with my other cadets and came out a uh, second lieutenant. And then by the time I was starting the JAG Corps, I was a first lieutenant. Um, and shortly after, I think it was like eight months in. Yeah, eight months into active duty time, I got promoted to captain. And then I spent the all of my active duty time as a captain, just more recently got promoted to major. Well, congratulations on that, yeah. sir. Thank you. Thank you. Um, now you've, you've, uh, let's go through this here. Now you've, you've gone through and you've completed, you've been accepted as a JAG officer. Mm -hmm. Uh, what happens now? Is it, do you stay state sides and do stuff? Do you go, do you travel around? Yeah, they, the way they work it is at the end of your training, you put in another preference sheet. So you get to pick your, your top three or five places where you'd like to be stationed. I ended up getting Fort Stewart, Georgia in the 3rd Infantry Division. That was either my first or my second choice. I can't remember. Uh, my mentality, like they have pretty much everywhere on the map open to you. I mean, the, everywhere that needs it, that, that has a JAG office, that has a spot available. Uh, so it's a big list of places. But uh, I got my first or my second choice. And this is in Fort Stewart's just south of Savannah. Uh, if you're familiar, so along the coast and one of the, so the infantry division in question, it, it got stood up around the uh, time of World War One, And um, yeah, I got to go down there and that's your duty station until the army tells you to move elsewhere. And so you, uh, you stay there. Typically the rotation is every two years, you'll, you'll move to a new base, new job kind of thing. Uh, but I got deployed. Oh man, I, Let's see here. I got there in June of 11 to Fort Stewart and I deployed in August of 12. So I had barely been there a year. I hadn't even fully unpacked everything in my, actually I, I got there three months later, I got tapped for a deployment to Iraq, started to pack up my apartment, had everything packed up, was fully trained up and ready to go to Iraq, literally had my bags by my door. And then we, uh, the, the president announced that we were withdrawing all troops. And so yeah. I was like, well, I remember texting my buddy. I was like, shit, what do we do now? <laughs> <laughs> and then, you know, fast forward eight months and I was in Afghanistan. Oh, man. Um, now, where, where were you located in Afghanistan? So down south, if you look at Afghanistan on a map, Kabul's up in the northeast. And if you trace down along the Pakistan border, I was down in south central Afghanistan at uh, Kandahar Airfield. Okay. And and what kind of work are you doing? The like specific, like uh, maybe not like deep, like in detail, yeah. but you know, like uh, uh, what kind of cases are you handling as an attorney on a military base overseas like that? I was an operational law attorney. So I advised on um, the rules of war, uh, rules of engagement, that sort of thing. So I, I physically sat in a command center that oversaw all combat operations for Southeast Afghanistan. So the, the way we were split up at the time, you had regional, regional commands. So we oversaw pretty much uh, from the Pakistan border uh, up to the Hindu Kush mountains, which kind of like bisect Afghanistan. In the Southwest, you had the Marines out of Camp Leatherneck, and then you had, uh, Let's see here what three other commands you had a command uh in the northeast where Kabul is a command up north and then a command out west and so we were probably uh other than southwest the marines um we were probably the most active this was still 
like I call it a shooting war at the time, very kinetic uh, down there, which means, uh, you know, a lot, a lot of fighting. Um, the area of our, uh, our region included the, the sort of home turf of the Taliban. And so it was a uh, very active, just being on the Pakistan border alone means you're, you're getting a lot of uh, fighters crossing the border and whatnot. So uh, very active combat area. Uh, fortunately, I'm on. If you have any familiarity, uh, CAF Kandahar Airfield is a, a huge base, so we would get, you know, rocketed. But I'm not out there kicking doors in or anything like that. I, you know, that's um, that wasn't my job. So I sit in the command center, uh, and and we have. It's sort of like if you've ever seen a movie about like NASA or you know space shuttle launches. They've got like the mission control with the big screens in front showing all the uh, data and stuff. That's sort of like what we had, except. Uh, instead of rockets and stuff up front, you had battlefield imagery. So we would have live streams from UAVs or gun cams from, you know, maybe a, a, an armed drone or a, uh, an attack helicopter or something like that. Uh, and then we had a battlefield map where we were tracking everything. And so uh, my job was to provide legal advice uh, as strikes happened, missions happened. You know, we were constantly in a planning cycle for operations. And you're a part of it because you, you the the kind of things that you read about on the news, civilian casualties, um, you know, damage, like all sorts of controversial stuff. Like your job is to to help make sure that operations are done correctly and within the uh, the boundaries of the law. And and then I'd get involved. You know, I I had other stuff too. You you know, everything from uh, evaluating targets to uh, psychological operations. Um, just providing a wide range of advice. Did you ever have to go out in the field or, any, or anything like that? Or I did. Yeah, we had um, we had a rash of they called them green on blue attacks. So these were uh, attacks on U.S. soldiers or NATO soldiers from Afghan soldiers, or, or usually it was Taliban members that had infiltrated. And you know, you'd be it'd be like U.S. soldiers kind of with their guard down or something like that in, inside a base or something like that. And all of a sudden the Afghan would open fire on them. So we stood up a team uh, that every time one of these would happen, we'd go out and investigate. And a lot of times these are happening like out in the field. So it's not necessarily at a base. And so I went out uh, on a, a few occasions to investigate those. Cause the whole thing was, how did this happen? Let's figure out you know, what happened, how it happened, and then figure out a way to stop these things. So the first one that I, I went on was um, a, a special forces team in central Afghanistan. Uh, a couple of their support members had gotten ambushed during a, um, uh, a meeting with some tribal elders that was happening in this like very small, very remote village. And so we had to go up there literally the day after this stuff happened and patrol out with a SEAL team and, um, you know, figure out what was going on. So, yeah. Yeah. I, I just, I can't imagine, uh, uh, being in a, in a war zone like that, no matter what you're doing. But, um, I mean, you just like, I, I think you're, my mentality was always like, I'm here to do a particular job. Right. But at the end of the day, I've got a baseline of training and I'm going to do whatever's required of me. And I remember toward the back end of my tours, so I was there for a year and I was with a buddy of mine and we were doing some stuff to, to get ready to go home. So we were in a, this big tent kind of doing some administrative work, to, you know, cause they've got to, you may not know, but they've got to do all these like administrative things to get you cleared out of there. So, you know, whether it's turning in certain gear or, uh, closing out certain accounts that you might have on base, like for your uh, for your meals uh, that, or whatever. Uh, so we're doing stuff like that. And all of a sudden, the base has a system of, uh, they call it the big voice system. So it's an alarm system. And there are different tones for different things that happen. So like if a rocket strike is coming in, there'd be a tone for that. And then the there's literally a big voice. It was like a very pleasant, like female British voice that would come on and be like, rocket, attack. And so we were used to like two or three of the warnings that happen most frequently, but we're sitting in this tent and we hear an alarm that we had never heard before. And then the voice comes on and it was like enemy in the wire, which means, uh, 
literally that that there's uh, enemy forces of some type uh, on the base. And I was like, that's weird. I wonder if this is a drill. And then somebody comes running in and, uh, you know, we talked about those green on blue attacks. There was um, some Taliban members that had infiltrated and had commandeered a, uh, I don't know what they, like a truck with a 50 cal on the back. And they were just driving around shooting at stuff. And my buddy looks at me and he's like, well, what are we supposed to do? And I was like, you've got an M4 strapped to your chest. You've got 30, a 30 round magazine in it right now. If, if we need to do it, you're going to lock and load around and you're going to engage targets as they come up. But you're not going to do that inside this tent because <laughs> there's a lot of, there's a lot of friendlies here. We're wow. going to, you know, there's going to be somebody that will give direction and we will give direction if need be, if that's, if that's how the chips fall, but you're going to do what you got to do. Uh, Cause I'm not going to die like waiting in a tent to get out process and turn in my meal card. Right. And so, um, yeah, it's just, it's a kind of a weird mentality that, that you adopt. And, and, you know, my, like, I wouldn't begin to compare my service to somebody like an infantryman that, that, is out there on patrol every day or whatnot. But, you know, my mentality was that I, I'm there to play a role. The Army's got me trained up to, to do a job, and I, that's what I'm there to do and and uh, help other folks get home in one piece. Excellent. Uh, thank you again for your service, man. That's awesome. Yeah, no, absolutely, man. Uh, now, how long were you over there before you came back stateside? And when you came back to the States, uh, where where did you come back to? A year, and then I came. I boomeranged right back to Stewart in Georgia and started working as a prosecutor. Um, now, what? Now, what kind of cases are are you handling now? Because obviously, cases stateside are going to be a lot different than in a war zone. Yeah, and this was a wide range of stuff. I mean, soldiers as as good a people as they are at their core still commit crimes from time to time. I should say, like the bad apples, right? Because there's bad apples in every organization but everything from like like petty larceny all the way up to to rape and i didn't have i didn't personally have a murder case but we had a murder case excuse me a um a high profile murder case going on while i was there so it's uh, you name it it's very much like a civilian uh, da's office the exception being you'll have s like some just military specific crime so like you're never going to see there, – there's no such thing as a wall in the civilian world. Like if you don't go to work, you just get fired. Right. In the military, you can get prosecuted. So we had a few a few military-specific crimes. But the um, as a prosecutor, you work for a unit. So I worked for a brigade, uh, an armored brigade combat team. So Bradley tanks – or excuse me, Bradley fighting vehicles, Abrams tanks. And any, any alleged crimes that – came up within that unit by that unit soldiers, I would be responsible for prosecuting or and advising the commander on. So I, you know, did a lot in two years, but it was, it ran the gamut. Um, now, now currently you're doing more international uh, law, mm -hmm. correct? Yeah. Uh, what point did that shift come into play? I got so I got off active duty in 2018 with my wife, uh, who's also Marissa was also on active duty with me, and was doing civilian practice, just completely unrelated stuff to anything I did in the military. And earlier this year, a uh, an opportunity with the American Red Cross came open uh, to do international humanitarian law, which is a version of what I was doing in Afghanistan. And so I've you know, I really, really love that field of law and it was a really good fit and I was lucky enough to get hired. And so now I, I work for the national headquarters for American Red Cross. Um, now, what kind of what what kind of places do you go to and what kind of situations are you facing when you go out and, and, and work for the Red Cross here? I go nowhere right now because of COVID. <laughs> Well, <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Yeah, um, we so we travel around in, in normal times. My team's mission is to uh, handle the uh, the U.S. government's obligation under the Geneva Conventions to disseminate and educate the public about international humanitarian law. Uh, so a lot of the, the bulk, the core of the work in terms of travel involves going around and doing speaking engagements, uh, teaching, interacting, because like my team is small and we don't there's no not enough hours in the day for us to execute that mission 
coast to coast and internationally. So we have a massive international team of volunteers and, and some paid staffers that really do this stuff, um, you know, out in the field, so to speak. So in normal times, we go out there, we train the people who are going to be providing the training. Uh, and then the other aspect of the job is more policy based. And the American Red Cross is one of a large number of national chapters. So like most countries, if not all, have a chapter of the Red Cross or the Red Crescent. They look a little different. The American Red Cross is probably the biggest and the most well-known uh, in the world. But, you know, Somalia has a Red uh, Red Crescent Society. Pakistan has a Red Crescent Society. Uh, Canada has a, a Red Cross Society. Those are part of one larger Red Cross movement. And uh, in addition to that, that movement, you have an organization called the International Committee for the Red Cross, whose sole focus is wartime humanitarian efforts. So in, uh, you know, the, the enforcement of, of international rules of law as it, as it pertains to conflict. But it's all one big umbrella. Like the, the American Red Cross is not on an island and we're not different than any other chapter. So we come together from time to time during the year and while the American Red Cross is a neutral organization, we don't take sides and we don't advocate for specific policies. Like you're not going to catch the Red Cross going to the Pentagon and saying, you know, you really shouldn't use this type of artillery munition because we think it's bad and it's bad to use. You're not going to catch us doing that. But we are at the table when discussions like that are had. And and when, a you know, the ICRC is is based out of Geneva, that's the, the war focused arm of the, the Red Cross movement. The ICRC does do policy stuff and they want to hear from the American Red Cross. They want to hear from folks like uh, the, the people on my team who have experience within the U.S. government and have a different perspective. And it, it really it creates a, a good conversation around some of the topics that they're batting around that you just wouldn't get if it was, you know, one or two countries discussing this alone. And, you know, while we don't advocate for a position, we try to contribute to the narrative and help guide the efforts in a positive way. Um, that You glazed over, so I assume it's as interesting as I... <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> I, I find this all very fascinating. Um, I think it's very interesting. Um, but uh, what I think is even maybe just a little bit more interesting now or adds to the interest is that not only do you do all of this, you are currently a Star Wars com not only competitor in the movie Trivia Schmodown, but uh, you just won the tournament uh, championship. Yep. Um, now, how did you first become aware of Christian Harloff and Mark Ellis? I have a funny story about that, and Christian will probably like give me shit for this later on. 2017 at Celebration, Star Wars Celebration in Orlando, was the first time I had ever officially presented a panel, and uh, it was on the the warfare of Star Wars, and it was on the fan stage. So if you've ever been to Celebration, they've got like your marquee official events, and then you've got all these fan run events. Um, and so I had a panel. We dump out, it was at the exact same time slot that The Last Jedi trailer dropped. So you can imagine, <laughs> that's like top billing for my panel. I'm like, great, everybody doesn't give a shit about anything other than seeing the new trailer. But my panel dumps out and I go outside the room and I'm with my buddy that was on the panel with me. And there's this line that's just snaking as far as the eye can see for the next panel. And I was like, what is that? Because you don't see, you see lines like that for like, you know, the actors speaking or like George Lucas uh, on a panel or something like that. You don't see lines stacked like that for, for fan run events. And so I go up to somebody in the line and I go, what are y'all in line for? And they go, oh, it's the Schmodown. It's a, a fatal five way. And I was like, it was like hearing Chinese. I was like, what? like Mandarin. I was like, the fuck is the Schmodown? That? And so I paid it no mind because I had still not seen the last Jedi trailer. And me and my buddy hustled down to the show floor to, to go watch it. And I, I just didn't even think about it. That panel was Whitwer and Campia and uh, I'm trying to think Jenny Nicholson, uh, that, that five way from 2017, uh, that sort of a famous one. I think that was the one where Whitwer lost on like a Captain Nita fucking question or something like that. But anyhow, like a, like a really famous match of the, sh 
the Schmodown. So I probably brushed shoulders with Christian and just didn't even know, didn't even have any clue. And so fast forward uh, into 2018, and I had become aware that uh, that Alex was involved. I knew Alex through through uh, Dragon Con, and I was aware that it was a trivia competition that he was dominating. But at the time, Star Wars wasn't what it was today. Like the division was just very small, and so like Alex didn't really get into to a whole lot about it, other than to say like, "Oh, it's you know, it's this other thing." So I didn't pay it any mind. I just got, it was a, 2018 was an insane time because we had just gotten out of the army. We had our first baby and, and all that. 2019 rolls around and I'm back at celebration and Alex is uh, talking to me and he's like, do you want to come to the, I, I got to defend my belt at celebration. Do you want to come out to the event? And I was like, yeah, of course. So he's like, okay, I, you know, I'll, t I'll tell Christian you're going to come and, and we'll get you a ticket. And so I said, okay. Uh, I go and I will never forget being in the pre-show audience, packed, packed uh, auditorium. Uh, there had to be like 1,500, 2,000 people. And the, the energy in there was like electric. And they were doing pre-show trivia. And I they, they said they were going to do some trivia. And I just assumed it was going to be movie trivia or Star Wars trivia. They started ask. I think Roka was also on the card there that night. But they started asking about Roka's like accuracy percentage and stuff, like stat questions. Mm. And I was like, "The fuck is this?" And like, no sooner had the the hype person or the MC asked the question, like, "What is his five pointer accuracy?" And I was like, "What the fuck is a five pointer?" It then people were like throwing their hands up in the air and being like, "Ninety seven point eight percent," and blah blah blah, like throwing out to the decimal his accuracy percentage. And uh, it was just, it was like being transported into another world. And as soon as the lights dropped and as soon as Damon and Scrimshaw get announced and go in into the arena, I was, I was hooked. I was like, where do I sign up? And I pulled Alex aside after the match. He's like, you know, basking in the, the light of defending the belt. I was like, you got to get in Christian's ear. You got to, you know, find a way how do i get involved in this because this is amazing and uh you know things just worked out you fast forward to, to the end of uh 2020 and he dms me and he's like you're in man or like cut a promo like christian wants to see it and uh what's funny is in between there i can't remember exactly when but i had typed out this entire message to christian basically a pitch for myself to justify why he should just give me a shot just not even let me into the league, but let me have a call to, to prove my trivia chops. I, uh, I'm ready. I go into Twitter and he doesn't accept DMs from people that he doesn't follow. And I was like, ah, oh, shit. So I guess this is going to die on the vine, but it's crazy to look back at all that and then be sitting here talking to you. It's just a wild ride. So I literally started as a fan and, you know, here I am. And was it Christian personally who contacted you? um after you after you sent in your promo video how did that process go no i sent um i didn't hear from christian directly that had to be an i mean his schedule is insanity yeah. normally but i can only imagine what it was like leading up to the draft because they had a ton of people submit stuff and i had no idea i was just like well here we go i i shot this stupid video let me see if anybody will like it and the next thing i know he had tweeted out the draft list and i was on it and i was like oh well okay, now how do I get drafted? <laughs> how does that process work? So, did, yeah. Did you get drafted? Did you do anything or did you just kind of sit there and... Coming on with folks like you, I just, you know, it was, I learned of, because Christian is, uh, I think, a, a big supporter of all the after shows or, you know, all the ones that he that he's able to, to take time and support. And I think he had retweeted a couple shows and so I started realizing that th there were in fact after shows i started watching some of the content and then i just cold dm'd a few shows and just just a shot in the dark to see if they would have me on and and the ball got rolling from there behind the scenes with all that i did get contacted like i met kaiser virtually and, and bateman and and the three of us talked and had a few conversations and stuff i um i talked to craig uh the barbarian i um talked a little with corruption 
and and did a combine with Winston and Swag. And so I met met a few. It, it's funny now because I had no perspective on anything. My my focus was like laser locked on Star Wars, and I was still sort of exploring and and like figuring out the bigger Schmodown world. So I'm sitting here on like a Zoom call with somebody like Shandrew, and I didn't fully understand who he was and his accomplishments and stuff. And he's just like pitching me Star Wars questions. And, you know, I look back on that. I'm like, it's probably good that I didn't know those things because I would have been a hell of a lot more nervous, I think. Right. <laughs> um, so. What was it like? The What was your first interaction with uh, Christian and or Mark? I don't know. I'm sure you've had some sort of interaction with Christian. Yeah, kind of limited. He's um, like you, you said. Could, He's 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 the busiest person that I think I, I I've met a number of very busy people, but he's got more plates spinning in the air than than I think anybody that that I know or as many as anybody I know. Um, it's really just been I look forward to like a live event or something because I'd like to just finally meet him in person. Yeah. Uh, but it's it's mostly been business stuff, you know, talking about a uh, you know character work and and just some some ideas from his front uh on on that side of things and um yeah that, that and and i say i think that's the one thing and and i would think he would admit this as well when you have a league as big as this is it and and as busy as he is with other projects it limits to a certain extent his ability to directly interact with folks and i think if you know if you if you cornered him and asked him one of the biggest things that i'm sure he misses from live events is just seeing everybody in person and having that like personal connection because you just it's just hard. like because what's he supposed to do like jump on a zoom call with me just to say what's up like whereas you know we could talk to each other in the studio and like be like oh that was a hell of a match or whatever it's just it's a different world and so that's more than than even looking forward to getting matches live myself or getting into the studio and having that experience the the possibility and the prospect of getting to to meet fellow competitors and folks like Christian and Mark in person and just bullshit for a little bit. That's, that's something they really, really look forward to as a competitor. And now you said, you said it right there, you're a competitor. Now, after this run is over, however long that could be three years or 15, 20 years. Um, at this point in time, I know you're, this is your rookie season, but uh, have you thought anything at all about some uh, some other way that you would like to be involved with Schmodown after your comp competing time is ended? Yeah, I I really love coming on and, and talking with folks like you. I mean, um, I think you were one of the first folks that I met in the, the larger sphere, and it feels like we have history now. <laughs> <laughs> but in, as short as it's been, it's been like six months, five months or something like that, but it feels like a lot longer. But I look forward to just like, like just talking Schmodown is a lot of fun. And, uh, you know, t having tapped into and established sort of a new circle of friends in this league. And I don't just mean competitors, but I mean reactors and, and folks that just cover the Schmodown or enjoy it as fans. Because having come from a place you know, being a fan when I started and, and I'm on a faction with people like that, like Saul is a, a shining example of that. Like a guy that started as a, like a caller to Collider Live and, and here he is competing. Um, that's what I would like to keep up. Just those relationships and the ability to just like rally around, continue to rally around, not just the trivia, but like movies that we love. I mean, cause that's, that's what's at the core of everything, which is neat. Now, yeah. well, you've done great so far. Oh, thanks, this man. Uh, really looking forward to seeing what your overall career arc brings, not only for you, but for the Schmodown. Um, uh, and, and now we've come to the portion of the show where uh, we're going to pay tribute to the great John Lipton, uh, host of Inside the Act. <laughs> um, I loved that show growing up, and, um, and, and I always learned a lot from those people, and it's one of the inspirations for this show. So yeah. in honor of John, uh, I will be asking you the 10 questions – that he asked his guests to close out uh, to close out his interviews. I feel like uh, I need my my whiteboard for the speed round. <laughs> no, there's no time limit here. Um, I'm not going to put you on the spot. Like <laughs> uh, uh, so, Thomas Harper, uh, what is your favorite word? I won't say the first word that came to mind because I've done enough cursing. <laughs> um. 
I would say this is going to sound really dorky, but sustained. It's just such a ple- like you make, and it's such a lawyer word. But you make an objection, you call call somebody on their bullshit, you make that challenge, sort of like a challenge in the NTS, and the judge agrees with you, and objection sustained, and you shut the other person down. I like that. Uh, what is le- what is your least favorite word? Moist. I don't know. I don't want to elaborate on that. That just makes my skin crawl. <laughs> um, what turns you on? Y wings. What? Wh- how could they not? Uh, and what turns you off? Uh, the A wing starfighter, garbage starfighter model. <laughs> <laughs> Only good for crashing into super star destroyers. <laughs> Uh, and what sound or noise do you love? Let's see here. I, you know, recently it's and your winner, and then my face pops in. Uh, no, I'm just kidding. Although it is good. It's that's uh, just like one of the iconic moments of MTS is hearing Christian or now Guy call that. Um, yeah, I don't know. I as a, I mentioned Top Gun. I just like the sound of a fighter jet taking off is like. As noisy as it is, it's just like pure power. I like that. Uh, and what sound or noise do you hate? Mm. The sound of a judge saying overruled. <laughs> You've lost your challenge. Sit down. Yeah, I don't know. My, I like if I thought about it enough, it would be one of my. I've, for those that don't know, I have two kids who are three and under. And so there are several, t- in fact, I know what the noise is. One of them has this godforsaken puzzle that's light activated. So like when, when it detects light, like it'll start making noises and it has no off switch and it's the freakiest. I'll be sitting there like quietly in the living room and you'll hear that fucking puzzle go off. And yeah, I want to like find it and snap it in half. My kids would never forgive me. <laughs> Uh, appropriately, the next question may be, uh, what is your favorite curse word? Fuck is so versatile. It's just, it's the Swiss army knife of curse words. Well said. Uh, what profession other than your own would you like to attempt? I would, I, like, I'm horrendous at it, but I would love to be, like, a really fucking good cook. I feel like, like you would never you would never be without friends if you're a good cook because somebody would always have you bring in like bring in something or be talking you up like have you have you had this fucking dish that that Thomas can make like you've never had uh, rice if you hadn't had what Thomas can prepare but I'm I'm like the person that you know microwaves everything and I'm just I married up I I married way above my my station in life so uh, yeah. Uh, and what profession would you not like to do? Hmm. I don't know. I'd like, I feel like an answer to that question, like almost, I wouldn't want it. Like, I'm not above anything. I'll do, you know, whatever, whatever anybody asked me to do or whatever is required. That's sort of my mentality in, in life. Um, I feel like, I'm not a big fan of like awful smells. So like a sanitation worker, like we had these uh, truck drive, these poor like contractors in Afghanistan who would have to go around and like empty the porta potties. And that just, they're always in hazmat suits, but I was like, there's no, there's no amount of layers that can save you from that smell. That, that to me, I do it. I do it for my family and send the money back home and, and support them. But I would probably hate every minute of it. <laughs> And finally, sir, if heaven exists, what would you like to hear God say when you arrive at the pearly gates? I've been watching your your fifty uh, your fifty time de- uh, defending the title, uh, the Star Wars title f- from up on high, and I'm impressed, sir. I'm just, <laughs> that would be kind of cool, but uh, no, I'd be like just getting a pat on the back and being like. You did well. Like you, you, you lived life. You, you did well, son. That's here's great. a here's a full size Y wing for you to fly around in heaven. Like, 
Hell yeah. <laughs> That's great. Uh, Thomas Harper, thank you so much for your time. Yeah, it's, thanks, man. Uh, getting to know uh, a lot more about you. Um, and uh, good luck in your upcoming Schmodown career. Yeah, thank you, sir. Great idea to, ha to do this. Be sure to check out Speaking of Schmodown, a sports talk show devoted to the movie trivia Schmodown airs Saturdays at 11.30 a.m. Pacific Time, 2.30 p.m. Eastern Time here on the Jcast Network.